welcome today's program on wireless E911 location accuracy roadmap moving from 123 degrees west longitude to 123 west Main Street. My name is Trey Forgetty and I'll be your host for today. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived at nina.org and on the NINA YouTube channel. The documents referenced in this presentation are available on nina.org and filed in FCC docket number 07-114 available at www.fcc.gov forward slash ECFS. We're happy to take your questions via text at any time using the webinar interface located on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we encourage you to use that throughout the presentation as we may be able to incorporate answers to questions that are submitted into our prepared commentary. We want you to be aware that your submissions may be used in the compilation of a frequently asked questions document. At the end of the webinar, if time permitting, we will accept live questions, so please use the webinar interface and click raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question live and on the air. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Fonts, Nina's CEO, for a bit of introductory matter. Thank you, Trey. What I want to do is just provide a bit of a background to this uh, agreement and what is this agreement uh, what has been included in this agreement that distinguishes it from efforts prior. For those of us who are on this call or webinar will remember back in the mid to late 1990s an effort to improve wireless location accuracy by looking at the XY coordinates was the only means of addressing uh, location accuracy. You'll recall at that time there was also the issue of whether you were a terrestrial uh, carrier in location services or whether you were a carrier that relied upon assist GPS. All of these would provide a metric in terms of meters when a wireless 911 call was made. What we are attempting to achieve in this agreement is a sea change in the way we have historically provided location for 911 calls and that is to move to the level of providing a dispatchable location or address. In addition to the dispatchable location and address, this agreement also takes a look at improving XY coordinates as well. So that is the first fundamental point I want to get across. Secondly, for those that do remember the late 90s and early 2000s, you'll recall that there was a great hope that the wireless industry would provide commercial location-based services and in essence have location accuracy for 911 mirror those services. In reality, it was probably too soon for commercial wireless location-based services at that time. Now commercial-based uh, location services are here in the wireless world and what this agreement does do is it moves 911 into the same technology that would be used for commercial location-based services. And the reason that is important is because it would enable 911 to remain evergreen, if you will, constantly renewed as carriers improve their networks, improve the handset requirements, their technologies and handsets over the years. And so that's a critically important element to this agreement. In addition to that, this agreement will provide a test bed where all vendors can come in and test their location technologies and that will also be reviewed by NINA and APCO and public safety writ large. Uh, this is the first time that such a test bed of this magnitude will be established and this is critically important. And finally, this agreement will track live 911 calls by location service so that we will be able to compare contrast of the various location platforms or technologies perform in their 911 uh, context. So these are the four main differences, if you will, between 911 in an E911 context and where this agreement goes to improving location accuracy. I would also like to thank uh, our colleagues over at APCO, Derek Porch and Jeff Cohen, who have been very much part of this 
uh, negotiation for the last seven, eight months. Uh, I will admit these negotiations, like any negotiations, uh, had their good times and their not so good times. <laughs> and there's a lot of work that goes into an agreement. So hats off to the four largest carriers, APCO, NINA, and certainly Trey for his contributions uh, to this negotiation. I also want to recognize that there are a number of folks out there who have been very critical of this agreement before it was even published. And uh, that is perhaps a little disturbing, but in reality um, that is driven by perhaps uh, causes and issues beyond just this agreement. Uh, the FCC, in developing this Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, in essence invited parties to negotiate an agreement. And I think in large part this was based on our successful negotiations on texting to 911. So there's a lot of information contained in this agreement. At this point, I would like to turn it over to Trey to walk through uh, some of the slides that he's prepared that will address the components of this agreement. Thank you, Brian. I'll move directly into the uh, presentation at this time. Again, my name is Trey Forgety. I am Nina's Director of Government Affairs. And we're here to talk about location accuracy. So I think it's important that we set the stage with a little bit of background on how location accuracy compliance works today. The current FCC rules and technical bulletins rely on carrier drive testing of networks to characterize the location accuracy performance of the various technologies they have deployed for wireless 911 calls they don't actually rely on live call data. And this is an important distinction because sometimes test data and live call data may differ. Now, all accuracy performance data that's done in this drive test uh, regime is carrier proprietary. And it's not something that public safety entities have an opportunity to routinely review. Uh, so that has caused, over time, uh, on occasions, mistrust between the carrier and public safety community. Uh, misplaced or not, uh, that has certainly happened, and it's something that uh, we hope in the future can be avoided. In today's compliance regime, carriers can elect one of two location accuracy compliance regimes, either a network-based regime in which they are obliged to locate 67% of all test calls within 150 meters and 90% of all test calls within 300 meters of their ground truth location as determined uh, by the onboard positioning capabilities of the drive test vehicles. The other, uh, the other, excuse me, the other option is for handset based carriers who must locate 67% of all test calls within 50 meters and 97% or excuse me 90% of all test calls within 150 meters of ground truth location. And again, I, I would emphasize that refers only to outdoor locations. So while those numbers seem very high, bear in mind that those only relate to drive testing data, not live calls, and that they only deal with outdoor uh, uh, accuracy, which the, the indoor circumstances are much, much, much tougher to deal with. And we believe that as much as uh, perhaps 70 or more percent of all wireless 911 calls actually come from indoors today. So if you bailed in all of those uh, indoor calls, that number would be vastly, vastly lower. Now, this roadmap that we've put together is based on a number of principles. And the first, most fundamental, and I think most important is we're changing the goal. We're no longer trying to get to 38 degrees, 48.36 minutes north latitude by 77 degrees, 3.48 minutes west longitude, which, let's face it, doesn't mean that much if you're the person in a car trying to get there, to 1,700 diagonal roads, suite 500, which many of you may recognize as Nina's headquarters. This is a fundamental shift in the paradigm of wireless location accuracy, and it's going to take a lot of work on the part of carriers, public safety, and others to bring it to a reality. At the same time, while we are changing the paradigm, we've been insistent that uh, car carriers also needed to make sure that we didn't have a coverage gap. So we're doing a few things to make sure that doesn't happen. First. We're going to use the test bed that Brian talked about to characterize the performance of location technologies in an open and transparent test bed that accurately represents the real world conditions that 911 calls originate from. 
we're going to base future compliance assessment on the data from those live 911 calls. This will help us to minimize any coverage gap for dispatchable location technologies by requiring improvements in latitude, longitude, and altitude technologies and unifying the compliance regime for indoors and out. That's an important point. This agreement gets us away from the 150-300-50-150 regime to a single regime aimed at getting 50 meter fixes or dispatchable locations every time. It also provides clear metrics and FCC enforceable terms along with fallback provisions to make sure that carriers adhere to the agreement over time while it accommodates legitimate unknowns such as the time required to complete standards work. For any of you who have been involved in standards work uh, with uh, NINA and you know what it's like when there are uh, you know, 100 to 400 people involved, imagine what it's like when you're dealing with global standards organizations with thousands involved. So we really did have to accommodate the reality that standards can't happen overnight, but we wanted to make sure that they did have to happen. Now the roadmap as it's structured comes in seven sections. Section one creates a permanent location accuracy test bed. Section 2 defines dispatchable location and shifts the emphasis of carrier compliance to delivering dispatchable location over time. Section 3 requires improvements to latitude longitude technology as well. And Section 4 implements enforceable metrics for assessing carrier performance. Section 5 establishes a transition, transition program to evaluate and phase in z-axis data, so uh, uh, raw barometric pressure or uh, perhaps ultimately altitude. Section 6 mandates a rigorous oversight process with the involvement of APCO and NINA and provides fallback provisions if it appears at a time in the future that things are not on track for dispatchable location. And Section 7 invites the FCC to codify key terms of the agreement that are within its jurisdiction. And I want to pause for just a moment on something that I consider very important. Um, dispatchable location. This really is, as everyone uh, has told us at NINA uh, over a long period of time, uh, dispatchable location is the civic address of the calling party, and that's what we need. That's what responders in the field need, to know which door to kick down, which door to uh, take down with the fire axe, etc. This really is the gold standard. It is where you are going. And I've pulled out the, the definition of dispatchable location from the roadmap. And dispatchable location is the civic address of the calling party plus additional information such as floor, suite, apartment, or similar information that may be needed to adequately identify the location of the calling party. It was important for Nina to make sure in this agreement that dispatchable location really was just that. We were adamant. It could not be just the address of the front door of a large building. It really had to get to the apartment or the suite or the room number. And I'm pleased to say that our carrier uh, partners in this agreement were able to agree on that, that, that this really is what we're driving at, and so we need to set the stake in the ground that this is the goal and this is what we're going to get to. Now, we've all had experience with the challenges associated with voice over IP technology and the registered address uh, uh, problems. So one of the other things that was important for Nina was to ensure that the civic address of the calling party number would be validated. For those of you on the technical side of 911, in the E911 context, uh, the civic address needs to be validated through MSAG, the Master Street Address Guide, and for uh, NG911 systems, it'll be validated through the location validation function. That's a very important point um, on the uh, interoperability of this system for the future. Next, in addition, we also insisted that civic address be corroborated against other location information before the address is delivered to the PSAP. This goes right to the heart of the VoIP problem. So for example, if the uh, dispatchable location associated with a particular beacon, which we'll come to in a minute, is um, in, say, Kalamazoo, Michigan, but the cell sector serving that call is in Alexandria, Virginia, obviously we don't want that Kalamazoo address to be sent in. We want a, a location, the best XYZ location we can get from Alexandria. And this corroboration process makes sure that that happens. So for section one, which establishes a location accuracy test bed, 
Um, that'll be stood up in 12 months, and that's going to be a permanent test bed where any location vendor, any carrier, anyone who has uh, a new method that they think could help to locate people in an emergency can come in and in a truly objective, transparent, open access, and public safety inclusive process can demonstrate the real world performance of their technology across all of the different morphologies that we know people make 911 calls from. So they'll have to look at them in outdoor situations, in indoor situations, in dense urban, urban, suburban, and rural morphologies. And there are really two reasons for this. First, having a permanent test bed allows us to remove all doubt about the art of the possible. There's a single place where vendors can come and, and demonstrate how their technology will or won't work. We can also characterize the performance of XYZ technologies to determine which ones qualify and to what extent as higher accuracy technology. Now I want to emphasize something here. Um, we're not doing away with uh, latitude, longitude, and altitude technologies. These are key things that are going to stay around. There will always be X, Y, and Z uh, associated with cellular calls. The uh, purpose of dispatchable location is to add a new layer of information to that that will help us to get uh, responders to the right door faster. Here's the timeline for dispatchable location technology. In nine months, carriers are going to provide us a proof of concept demonstration of dispatchable location technology using Wi-Fi and Bluetooth LE. Several months after that, they'll complete the required standards work to enable dispatchable location support in compliant handsets and networks. A few months after that, all new carrier-provided wireless home phone and femtocell products uh, will be required to provide a dispatchable location. And I want to emphasize here another thing. Carriers are going to work with us to introduce wireline equivalent routing for these, process, these products. That's a, a key thing that we've heard from across the public safety community that we want to get away um, from the, the, the challenges uh, associated with um, cellular routing for an essentially wireline-like fixed product. Uh, and the carriers have agreed to do that. Um, at 36 months, Carriers, NINA, and APCO will jointly design and implement a national, I should say by 36 months, uh, we will jointly implement a national emergency address database that correlates the physical MAC address, that's the media access control address, the sort of hard-coded numbers of individual Wi-Fi and Bluetooth LE beacons with dispatchable locations. Now the rollout uh, of dispatchable location technology is going to be going on on a parallel track. Carriers have agreed to introduce support for dispatchable location technology in their new Volte handsets along these times. So within 18 to 24 months, 25% of all new Volte handsets um, will, be, uh, will include dispatchable location capabilities. Uh, after, then that's after the completion of standards, I should emphasize. So you can add another 18 months to this to, to get all of that done. 50% uh, would be 24 to 30 months post-standards, and 100% of all new LTE handsets uh, within 30 to 36 months post-standards. And they'll also be introducing support for dispatchable location technology across their entire nationwide networks within 24 months after standards completion. I want to emphasize that is uh, truly a, uh, a, a monumental feat to get it rolled out nationwide for four major carriers in that time frame. Um, they've also uh, agreed to provide end-to-end -end support all the way down to the alley providers and ultimately the PSAPs uh, within 48 months of the date of the agreement. So we should start seeing that in uh, the, uh, in the PSAP uh, within uh, 48 months. And th these are hard deadlines, by the way. They've got to get to these uh, uh, as stated, essentially. Now I want to give a couple of uh, technical definitions here, because the agreement does reference a couple of specific technologies that the carriers have agreed to deploy to improve the XY capabilities of their networks, the latitude longitude capabilities, um, as we, to sort of fill the gap as we transition to uh, latitude longitude, or excuse me, to dispatchable location technologies. The first, OTDOA, 
stands for Observed Time Difference of Arrival. And it relies on handset measurements of the difference between arrival times of precisely synchronized transitions from nearby cell towers. Essentially what this does is it uses, uh, for each pair of towers that it can hear, the handset can hear, um, it is capable of generating a line of position. And where two or more of those cross, that is the caller's location. LTE is very cleverly designed in this regard because it synchronizes those uh, positioning transmissions, those dedicated positioning transmissions, so that they don't overlap from cell to cell. And that, that's really, it's a little bit different than you normally think of the way uh, uh, cell networks work, but it allows the handset that's in and being served by one cell to listen for and hear neighboring cells to get positioning information. Very critical thing. The other technology is called AGNSS. Now this is a generic term. It stands for Assisted Global Navigation Satellite System. And it relies on handset measurements of ranging signals that come from two or more constellations of satellites. Today there are two of those operating. In the US we have the Navstar constellation, which most of you probably know as GPS, and the Russian GLONASS constellation. I want to emphasize those are the only two that are around right now. But there are two more, one from Europe called Galileo and one from China called Baidu, that are in the early stages of their deployment and should be complete within a decade. Um, those should be uh, really powerful additions because they're going to bring uh, many, many more satellites, which gives you a much better opportunity to uh, get a fix uh, deep indoors when you can only see part of the sky. Uh, it also will bring uh, in the future possibly um, handsets capable of receiving on multiple frequencies for uh, GNSS systems, and that really is a game changer down the line. So getting on the same commercial path uh, that handsets are on for these advanced positioning chips uh, is really a critical thing. Today, even in devices that have an onboard GLONASS receiver, um, there's no assistance data available, so that can't be used for 911. This transition means that as we go forward in the future, we'll be able to leverage all of the same technologies that are going into the, the top-end handsets from Apple and Samsung and Google, um, at, all the way down to the lowest-end handsets that they eventually trickle down to, uh, just the way other commercial uh, capabilities would. In addition, uh, so the carriers have committed to pr uh, introducing both OTDOA and AGNSS throughout their networks and to support hybrid measurements using both systems. And they've agreed to do that for uh, uh, Volte handsets that they're going to be introduced along uh, these time frames. 50% uh, of the uh, handsets at 24 months, 75% at 36 months, and 100% at 48 months. And here, we're not talking about after standards. We're talking about from the date of the agreement, so from uh, uh, Friday before last. And the carriers are going to test these uh, latitude and longitude. They're also going to test latitude and longitude estimates based on crowdsourced Wi-Fi and Bluetooth measurements in approximately 36 months. That may actually happen sooner um, because we, we're already hearing that uh, this sort of crowdsourcing latitude and longitude capability from Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, is uh, in early stages uh, of testing, and the, the, the results look pretty good from a couple of the major uh, handset and software providers. Um, I've been asked here to define a term, and I wanted to, uh, to go back and pick this up. VOLTE, V-O-L-T-E, that stands for Volt Voice Over LTE. And uh, that, that's the next uh, generation of voice technology that's uh, already currently in the um, uh, in a number of handsets and in networks, uh, but is being enabled by carriers for voice calling uh, this year and, and next year uh, primarily. So, um, and, and this is an important thing, um, if, even if you have an LTE handset today, it's probably not using voice over LTE yet. Um, they're currently using something called circuit switched fallback, uh, which allows them to use the uh, circuit switch networks to handle those calls uh, when you make a voice call, including a 911 call over LTE. Um, now, let's get on to the performance metrics here because I think this really is the heart of the agreement. One of the things that we've seen in the past is um, with, with uh, carrier compliance based on test data rather than live call data is the generation of a lot of 
mistrust, misunderstanding, suspicion, et cetera. So in this agreement, we've, we've, uh, we've come to a point where we're going to change that paradigm as well. And starting with this agreement, carriers are going to report on live call data in six markets chosen to be representative of the, the morphologies uh, evaluated by the FCC's uh, uh, Communications Security Reliability and Interoperability uh, Council. And the reports that carriers are going to generate from those markets will indicate the positioning source method for every 911 call delivered in those markets. And that could be dispatchable location, AGPS, AFLT, RTT, a whole acro acronym soup of different technologies. But what this will do is for the first time, it will let public safety know what the yield is for these individual technologies, how much a carrier is relying on a very accurate technology like dispatchable location, and how much they're relying on a, a less accurate technology like RTT or cell ID. And then to the extent that a given positioning source gets us either a dispatchable location or an accuracy of 50 meters or better, carriers will get credit for that fraction of their fixes. So if they go out and uh, put in a technology that is um, highly, uh, uh, highly accurate, gets a, l a large fraction of good fixes that are 50 meters or better, uh, they get credit for those. And at the same time, if they are able to go out and uh, to get um, uh, better than that, to get dispatchable location, they get full credit for that as well. Now here are the core so these deal with uh, the percentage of calls that carriers will have to either get to 50 meters or better or a dispatchable location. So within two years, they'll need to be at 40% of all wireless calls, within three years at 50%, and within five years at 70%, 75% of all Volte wireless calls, and 80% of all Volte wireless calls within six years. Now the critical thing here, and I want to emphasize this, um, these are not metrics that are going to be uh, necessarily easy to get to. Um, they are certainly achievable, but the carriers are going to have to work at this because especially for 50% of all wireless 911 calls within three years, um, they, they really are going to have to do some things on the uh, latitude and longitude side uh, to make improvements there to hit that target. Um, because the dispatchable location technologies that will allow them to get to the 75 and 80 percent metrics won't yet be in the market. Um, we have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth devices deployed out there, but we don't have the database that we need to correlate those with um, addresses. Now to make sure that it's not just the six test markets where this actually works, the carriers are going to have to certify that their networks are similarly equipped, deployed, and maintained outside of those test markets. And this is a place where moving to live call reporting is going to be especially powerful because uh, we're working with the carriers to get the position source types uh, available to individual PSAPs that want to get those as part of their alley feed. And so on a PSAP by PSAP basis, you'll be able to see what fraction of your calls um, are actually coming in with these heightened accuracy location technologies. So that, that performs, that acts like a, a sort of a check and balance to make sure that things really are working uh, across the networks um, in the way that we expect they should. And one of the other things that was very important to Nina uh, in this agreement was that we somehow address a vertical uh, location component. This is really a, a very tough thing to do because currently there are no standards for how this should be done. Uh, there are no standards for how you get from uh, even a barometric rating up to an altitude, which is still an important, uh, uh, an important transition. Um, and so what we've come up with is we're going to agree, and this, this really uh, ultimately helps us uh, you know, avoid lengthy litigation and, and gets us to real measurable improvements. We've agreed that there will be a study within six months from uh, a week ago Friday to evaluate options for using raw barometric pressure readings in the field. The way this would work is um, a, an alley display would come across with a number. Let's say it's 101.3 kilopascals. That's a, a pressure rating. That number could then be relayed to responders in the field equipped with a barometer of their own 
who could simply get in a building and either ascend to the stairs or uh, rise up in the elevator until the number on their barometer matches the number reported to the PSAP. Now, that's not ideal because it requires uh, new hardware in the field. It requires uh, a lot of work to you know, train and educate folks. But it acknowledges that there are barometry capabilities in mobile devices today that we may be able to leverage for public safety use to get us some vertical information much more quickly. Now, the harder part is getting to altimetry, going from a barometric pressure reading like 101.3 kilopascals to get to something like 75 meters above mean sea level. That's a lot harder because you need a very localized pressure reference so that you sort of know where sea level is from a pressure standpoint. That's hard. You've got to get uh, network capabilities. You've got to get sensors deployed out there. Uh, it, it really is a longer term uh, process. And the carriers have decreed, uh, agreed, depending on the outcomes of these efforts, to deploy at least uncompensated barometry solutions within three years. Now, we remain optimistic about that. And although uh, altimetry data is only covered in the fallback metrics uh, for this agreement, um, we know that there are already three different providers uh, with uh, barometric assistance services uh, at least offered in the marketplace. Um, don't know yet you know, if, if they work for certain, but they're certainly going to be tested. Um, and so we're hopeful that uh, if, if the technology is proven out, that we will actually be able to get to uh, barometric altimetry uh, on, uh, on, a, on a sort of a medium and longer term time scale. So more to come on that, and we're, we're going to keep pushing on that point. And I think another important point that uh, a number of uh, folks have asked us about uh, here in the questions um, is uh, how we're going to, to, to really evaluate this and know what's going on um, and how we're going to um, uh, decide whether carriers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So Nina and APCO are going to formally evaluate carrier performance and adherence to timelines throughout the term of this agreement. Just because we're saying that there's going to be a formal uh, assessment at, th at the three-year mark, uh, we're going to be looking at this uh, throughout the term of the agreement to make sure that the time frames uh, stay on track and that the standards uh, continue to be met. Now, there are going to be some reasonable variations in time periods. Um, you know, uh, uh, we have to understand that the standards development cycles uh, aren't completely under the control of any one or even all four of our nation's largest carriers, because those really are global processes at this point. But I can tell you uh, personally that we are going to be very closely monitoring how that process uh, going. Uh, how that process is going to make sure that things do not start slipping more than we think is acceptable. So uh, we will be the cop on the beat uh, for the time periods uh, in this agreement. At the 36-month mark, as I mentioned, APCO and NINA are going to conduct a major assessment to determine whether the development and deployment of dispatchable location technology is on track. If we decide it is, great. We continue going down that path. The carriers continue deploying that technology. And we do everything we can to get as many dispatchable location fixes delivered to the PSAP as is possible. If not, the agreement contains fallback provisions that require carriers to make stringent improvements in latitude, longitude, and altitude, not just barometry, altitude, uh, on a going forward basis. And that was very important to us to make sure that, you know, uh, if we go down this high-risk, high-reward dispatchable location path, that uh, we had some fallback in case things went wrong. We're certainly hoping that they won't, but if they do, we know what will happen. And as part of that, as part of making sure that things happen the way they should, we've included provisions in the agreement that the carriers have agreed to uh, that will support FCC codification of certain aspects of the agreement. For example, we've invited the FCC to codify the definition of dispatchable location contained in the agreement, uh, the dispatchable location handset deployment timelines, the network design and end-to-end -end functionality timelines, uh, the AGNSS handset deployment timelines, and our agreed-upon performance metrics that we talked about. That's the 40% uh, uh, in two years, 50% in three, 75 of Volte in five, and 80 of Volte in six. 
and the commission, I should mention, will have uh, full power to, to enforce all of those rules uh, with forfeitures and orders and court decrees and so on, uh, just as they do under the current rules. Now, this agreement has already faced some objections, and we would be remiss if we didn't uh, candidly address what those objections are and who they come from. So I'm going to start with the latter question. Most of the objections to this agreement have come from two sources. One has been location technology vendors. Now, these companies either have some new technology that they want to sell or some old technology that they want to salvage because time has moved on and new technologies are replacing it in the market. So whenever you see any um, uh, objections to this agreement, take a close look at the folks they're actually coming from and ask, your question, ask yourself the question, what are they trying to sell or what are they trying to salvage? If you can come up with an answer for that, I think you know why folks may be opposing the agreement. And the second thing um, are what are called in Washington AstroTurf organizations. You may have heard of grassroots organizations. Well, AstroTurf is like grassroots, but fake. AstroTurf organizations are typically closely associated with interested parties like vendors, typically lack an independent board of directors, lack diversity of funding sources, and have low or no requirements to join. And I'll give you one example. One of the organizations that has strenuously objected to this agreement uh, counts every like that they get on Facebook as a membership in their organization. Now, for those of you who uh, uh, religiously pay your Nina dues every year and, and show up to participate in our standards work and our committee work and everything else that we do as an association, you understand that uh, real association work and real advocacy requires real dedication, real involvement, real commitment. It's not just about a like on Facebook. So I hope that you'll consider, um, the, uh, consider these types of organizations for uh, what, this, what they are. Now, on to what those objections have actually been. And there have been four primary things that people have raised. First, they've complained that the roadmap establishes longer time frames than those proposed by the FCC. Second, they've objected that the roadmap eliminates the vertical accuracy requirement proposed by the FCC. Third, that it does not improve location accuracy for legacy devices. And fourth, that it, it relies on uh, a foreign power uh, in including references to GLONASS, the Russian Global Navigation Satellite System. Well, here's the reality. The roadmap does establish somewhat longer time frames, but for a much tougher standard, dispatchable location instead of 50 meters. That was a key thing for the, those of us on the public safety side to make sure that if we're going to go down this time frame, if it's going to take longer, that we really do get to something that is meaningfully better. The roadmap also includes provisions for the z-axis, but we recognize that getting barometric sensors into handsets, deploying local reference pressure networks, and standardizing pressure assistance data in the network are longer-term problems. They're simply not things that could have been done on the time frame proposed by the Commission. Now, no final rule could have required latitude-longitude improvements for legacy devices on legacy networks and survived court scrutiny. That's why there isn't anything in the roadmap that deals with the entirety of legacy devices. Now, I can say that we're actually optimistic that there will, in fact, be some Im improvements for these, uh, despite that, that lack of inclusiveness, because uh, we know that some carriers, at least, may be capable of adding support for uh, GLONASS capabilities in existing handsets using that for 911, where previously it's only been available on the commercial side. And we're looking forward to that. Um, so the long and short is the FCC's rules wouldn't have exactly mirrored its proposals anyway, because the Commission knows, as does Nina and the rest of uh, uh, the public safety community, that uh, the, the practical realities of handset turnover and network turnover have to be taken into account in any rule in order to survive a court challenge. And to the last point, currently GLONASS is the only additional global navigation satellite system that is available. As others come online, we certainly encourage carriers to use those to improve the fraction of 50 meter fixes that they get with AGNSS. But Currently, GLONASS is it. It's the US GPS constellation and GLONASS. 
the Europeans have started launching their Galileo system, but their first launch resulted in three satellites going into the wrong orbit. And the Chinese haven't gotten much farther than that either. So there's more to come on this, but for now, GLONASS is all there is, so GLONASS is what we put in the agreement. Now, at this point in time, I'm going to uh, open up to a question. Um, we've got a few people who have raised their hands, uh, but first I'm going to defer over to Brian to wrap us up a bit. Great. Thank you, Trey. I want to thank you for your excellent presentation on the contents of what this agreement contains. I think it's important to recognize the detail and the substantial amount of work that went into this. I also wanted to comment that for those that have opposed this, assumed that the Commission would adopt exactly what it presented in its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. For anyone with a history uh, with the FCC or dealing with the FCC, we'd recognize very early that oftentimes what the Commission proposes in its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking differs from what the Commission would adopt in its report and order, in large part reflecting public comment uh, in the record. I just wanted to make sure that that point was addressed as well. And I know that uh, a lot of work has gone into this uh, by the carriers, APCO and NINA. Uh, again, I just particularly want to thank Trey for his uh, work in the presentation today. And frankly, I couldn't imagine a better way to spend your birthday than with 500 plus folks on a webinar. So thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, we have a, uh, a a couple of questions here. Uh, I'm going to uh, just go down through uh, some of these because there are a lot of the same question coming in from various folks. But um, what I have here is, is there a specific geographic location of the proposed test bed? For example, San Francisco. I want to thank Scott Sherwood for submitting that question. Uh, Scott, to answer your question, uh, we don't know yet for certain exactly where the test bed will be. Um, to answer another question involved here, uh, Nina and APCO We'll be working with the carriers to stand up an independent uh, test bed uh, uh, platform. I don't know exactly what the organizational structure of that will be yet, um, but uh, that is something that we're going to do. And we're going to make sure that it's in a location where we have the ability to look at all of the different morphologies that matter. So we want to be able to look at dense urban, certainly, where indoor is a particular challenge, but also the regular urban, suburban, and then also the sparsely populated rural areas. Uh, where uh, you know a lot of outdoor technologies like AGNSS actually provide really really good fixes, uh, and and as I said before, we're going to continue; those will continue to be available. Uh, so we want to make sure that all of those different morphologies are uh, adequately taken into uh, consideration. Um, we also have another question here. Um, uh, from Steve Souter, uh, if the FCC amends the agreement, will the impact of uh, that amendment alter significantly the intent of the agreement as it's currently written? Um, that, that, Steve, is, is uh, largely an unknown, but I, I can tell you what's going on right now. Um, just this past week, the FCC issued a public notice putting the agreement out for public comment. Um, and so uh, we're encouraging all of our members to get out and support this paradigm shift to dispatchable location um, and to encourage the FCC to uh, codify the terms of the uh, agreement that, that are set out for that codification. Um, if I had to read the tea leaves, would I say that a, a final rule is likely to mirror the language of the agreement exactly? Probably not. Uh, there, there's just no way to know. Um, there are likely to be some tweaking around the edges, but uh, you know that's sort of par for the course uh, in, in a regulatory environment. Um, so uh, another great question here from Ken Paxson. Uh, while the four major carriers have agreed to work on location improvements, what enforcement will be placed on smaller carriers? Kim, that's a great question, and it's something that uh, we've already been uh, talking about. Um, we are going to pursue uh, discussions with the Competitive Carriers Association. Uh, it includes Sprint and T-Mobile, who are two of the signatories to this agreement but also a host of other smaller carriers that have um, uh, you know, sort of very different uh, uh, interests, very different time frames, very, very different geographies. Um, and we'll be working with them to try and solicit uh, their support for the approach in this agreement. 
Um, but ultimately, uh, if, as we have proposed, the Commission codifies the terms, uh, certain terms of the agreement, then uh, those codifications would be applicable to the smaller and rural carriers um, as well. I'd like to go to a um, uh, to I think a, we just add one point to that, yeah. Trey. Uh, this is a classic example of where an FCC decision may come into play here. Historically, in a number of issues relating to the wireless industry, the Commission has recognized uh, the distinctions between Tier 3 carriers, the smaller carriers, and the large carriers. Oftentimes, this has been addressed through FCC rules by having longer periods of time or a different compliance time schedule associated with the rules. So going back to Steve Souter's question, you know, what modifications may be included in this, it remains to be seen. But this is one example where the FCC could do something different for rural carriers. And it's important to recognize that these four largest carriers represent 97% of the subscriber base of wireless services. Now I'd like to go for a live question to uh, one of Nina's past presidents, Bill Hinkle. Bill, your line is live. Maybe Hello, Bill. Would you like to ask, ask your question? OK, we'll try Bill again in a few minutes. Uh, next, we're going to go to uh, Leanne Erland. Uh, Leanne, your line is now live. Leanne? Leanne? Okay, looks like we're getting some feedback, so we'll mute Leanne. Um, let's try this uh, one more time. We're going to go with Alan Muse. Your line is now live. Alan, do you have a question? Okay. Well, sorry we uh, haven't been able to get to any more live questions. Um, we have a number of additional questions here, um, and uh, I'd like to, to touch on those. One of the questions uh, we received from Christian Milito, who is the lead organization for standards development. Uh, Christian, I wouldn't say that there is a single lead, because there are aspects of this agreement that are going to have to be uh, developed in carrier standards bodies. There are aspects that are going to have to be uh, developed in uh, a NINA or APCO type uh, standards body. Um, there, there are several different places uh, where this work is going to have to happen. Um, so I, I just want to say that at this point I don't think there is a quote unquote lead organization, um, but we've been very clear with the carriers and they with us that we're going to get to uh, a representative involvement in all of the different bodies um, in this uh, in this agreement, I have another good question here from Mark Garland. Where does the dispatchable address come from? Is that reverse geocoding, or is it hard coded to the MAC address? Uh, Mark, that's a, a critical question, and the answer you've got it right with the second part. Um, it will be hard coded with the MAC address in the um, in the National Emergency Address Database. Um, and I can flip back here for a second. Um, when we talked about the gold standard of dispatchable location, uh, the two things here that I would uh, emphasize again is that uh, the civic address of the calling party has to be validated either in the E911 contact context through MSAG or in the NG911 context through the location validation function. And it also has to be corroborated against other location information that the carrier may have before they send the call with the address to the PSAP. And that's very important to make sure that we, again, don't have the same problem that we've had with uh, voice over IP. Uh, we'll take one more question here very quickly before we move on to the next uh, short section. Um, Uh, I got this one from Chuck Spaulding. I think this one's really cool. Um, is there a specific, uh, particular scenario presented by a carrier, such as inside a mall or college campus, that we found exciting? Um, I think the, the answer to that is yes, absolutely. And it's uh, for me, it's really the office building or the apartment building. Because um, under the FCC's proposal, uh, I, I did a, a quick little walk around. My apartment building 
is uh, almost exactly 75 meters long uh, on the long axis and only about you know 15 or 20 on the short axis. Um, the, so for my building, if all we had was a 50 meter fix, um, I could have been virtually anywhere within that structure. And even if you had the best vertical location information that the commission proposed to include, you could have only gotten it down to uh, between two and three floors, realistically. Um, so that in, in my building is, you know, 40 to 60 different apartments. With dispatchable location, we're getting it down to one apartment. And, and for me, that really is the most exciting thing to know that if I call 911 uh, because I have a medical emergency, uh, the guys on the bus can get right to my door without having to go floor to floor, door to door, and, and, and knock around to find me. Um, I, I think that's uh, really a, a very powerful, uh, powerful thing. Um, now I'd like to shift uh, to a little bit about how you can learn more about this agreement. And the most important thing at this point is going to be 911 goes to Washington. Uh, this year we'll have a day and a half of in-depth interviews and Q&A sessions with the officials charged with setting 911 policy at the federal level, plus an entire, uh, we're going to have our a topical Tuesday this year solely about location accuracy, and it's going to focus on the roadmap along with the technologies, vendors, regulators, and public safety professionals who are going to help us navigate down that roadmap. After that, we're going to move into a day and a half of intensive legwork on Capitol Hill, educating members of Congress about 911, how issues like reliability and location accuracy impact the lives of their constituencies. We'll also have networking opportunities to make sure you learn better how to have an impact on policy at the local, state, and federal levels. And so you know, uh, housing closes for that on January the 28th, so we encourage you to book now for discounted rates and register online at www.nina.org forward slash GTW. Um, and uh, to let everybody know, we also do now accept checks online, so that makes it even easier. Uh, if you'd like assistance with your registration, please call us at 202-618-6369. One other point I wanted to add to that, uh, the timeliness of 911 Goes to Washington at the end of February will likely coincide with the Commission's decision which will most likely be in January or February time frame. So uh, this is a timely uh, presentation of what the Commission will ultimately come out with with its rules and to have a more intense discussion on the agreement, the rules, and all aspects of improving location accuracy. All right, and ladies and gentlemen, we'll also be developing a frequently asked questions document based on your questions today. We apologize if we haven't been able to get to your question. Uh, but hopefully uh, we'll see it addressed in some way in uh, the FAQ document. Thank you for joining us for uh, today's webinar, and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank Goodbye. You.